Well, just when you thought it was safe to go back inside the Beltway and stop worrying about those silly mundane issues like funding the government again, sneaking up right behind the daily Trump travails and a smirking Hillary Clinton comes, the specter of yet another shutdown and yet another scrambling attempt to avoid another midnight deadline. Yogi Berra would be proud of deja vu all over again. Welcome back to Professor of Business at the University of Maryland, veteran economist, political analyst, explainer of all deadlines, Peter Morisi, alongside veteran economist and author of The American Dream Under Fire, Steve Beeman. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Peter, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. A shocker coming out of Politico today. Help wanted top negotiators to stave off shutdown. Peter, we were just here. Why are we here again? Well, it's the way the congressional districts are divided up and the way the Senate falls these days. Uh, there simply are not a whole lot of moderates in Congress, especially the House. So it's increasingly looked to the Senate to come up with some kind of grand compromise. Two great senators. And, you know, that's just not happening these days. I mean, we need Bill Brock and Bob Dole and Ralph Strauss and all the rest of them who understood you got to compromise to govern. Well, I think, Steve, they made a great point here where they talked about one of the individuals involved is Bernie Sanders, <laughs> who would be involved in hashing out a deal. But Bernie Sanders happens to be doing something like running for president anyway. How do we get to the point where we've got basically Ryan Murray is gone, Sanders' price is sitting there, no one's watching this candy store? Well, and this is going to be disastrous. Bernie's about as far off there as you get. So I don't, I'm not sure how they're going to come to this. But the reality is, as um, Peter was saying, this is just a function that our Congress has become more polarized over time. The primary system is throwing more and more conservative candidates in and more and more liberal candidates in. So we're getting that parsing in the middle. And there are very few people there who want to sit down and work it out. So no one wants to work with anybody, and here we go again. So, Steve, I guess your best guess is, are we looking at another shutdown? Are we going to go right down again to another midnight deadline? I think we'll go right down to it. We might even shut it down for a few days, but eventually the political heads prevail, and in a presidential year, nobody wants to raise too much of a ripple on this. Oh, my goodness, please. Okay, no, really, it's okay, guys, because we love these sort of things. It gives us a lot to talk about when we come around to midnight deadlines. Uh, Peter, let's go ahead and talk about China a little bit here. Goldman Sachs says the U.S. economy is mostly insulated from the stock plunge in China. Okay, there's a lot of people out there, we love those words, mostly insulated insulated that doesn't mean completely yes well it doesn't mean completely we certainly are insulated from its stock market because we're limited in our ability to invest there and institutions have been very cautious about china knowing there is a lack of transparency their bubble is largely caused by domestic money the the people's bank printing it the banks lending it out and people buying on margin so they'll all lose money together over there However, China is 15% of the global economy, and if it stops growing, it does have a ripple effect. But hey, wait a minute. Because of its undervalued currency, it doesn't buy very much from us. So we don't lose much in the way of exports. The real threat, though, is that the Chinese start subsidizing their exports even more to try to find a way to boost their economy. The ultimate stimulus package is to move unemployment from factories in Shanghai to factories in Toledo. Steve, knowing that China holds, I think, what, 98.999% of our debt these days or something like that, <laughs> is there any way that they would weaponize this? I mean, let's get down to the bottom end here. China wants to do something. I know that they're dependent on us. We're dependent on them. But can they ever really weaponize all this debt and make us pay for it in one shot? No, first of all, let's recognize we owe ourselves most of our debt. So China may of the external debt own a big chunk of it, but of our total debt, we really owe it to ourselves. The second thing to realize is that China exports about $185 billion a year to the United States against our exporting $46 billion to them. So they don't want to hurt us too much or we'll stop importing that $185 billion. So they're a little bit in a conundrum there. They don't want to put too much pressure on and hurt our economy. By the same token, we want to see China grow healthily, get out of this bubble they've built, as Peter was saying, from printing too much money. And hopefully they can continue a stable growth base and not export that problem around the world. 60 seconds. I'm going to get there. Oh, wait a minute. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. I stepped on you. It's a complicated, but some quick international finance. What they basically do is print a lot of yuan to undervalue their currency, and they end up with dollars in their hands. Read that. Dollars. So what they do is they use those dollars to buy bonds because they want something that bears interest. If they hold on to those dollars instead, they go out of circulation. The Fed can print new dollars and buy the bonds China is selling, which means the Federal Reserve gets the interest 
instead of the People's Bank of China. We have defenses Greece does not have. Okay, I only got about 30 seconds left, so Steve gets a last word on this end. I wanted to go back to Bernie Sanders one second. He was called in a Vox.com article a national socialist. Steve, do you think we <laughs> should at any time be scared that Bernie Sanders turns us into a socialized nation? No, I don't think he has a prayer. In fact, Bernie came out recently and made a comment that he didn't understand why we had 23 types of deodorant when we have such huge deficits. It reminded me of travel I did throughout the United States in the early 1990s with people from the Soviet Union when they couldn't <laughs> understand why we had so many types of cereal. So I think Bernie's on a losing path, and I think his ideology will die with his candidacy. Oh, it's all just political entertainment, if you will. And Peter had a good laugh at that as well. Peter Marisi, Steve Beeman, gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Coming up next, Talk of new internment camps in America and a flag flap at the White House.